you all for being here. Good afternoon, uh, and thank you for that great intro, Patrick. I appreciate that. Uh, the Cornhole Tournament, uh, it just to, since we mentioned it, is something that you can look forward to hearing more about. I'm hoping you meet it in August. We're looking at partnering uh, once again with the Akron Leather Box at the stadium. So it's a really family-friendly event, so please stay tuned for that. Uh, today, our task at hand is to discuss social media and, and its impacts on the work environment. Uh, this is such a broad topic, and it's one that I have pretty closely followed throughout my legal career, mainly because uh, I think I had just passed the bar exam in 2007, and I was already at my first client meeting, and there was a big round of discussion, I remember, and it was, it was a group of, of folks from you know, the HR management <coughs> talking about social media and at that time my space was still a really big um, platform for social media I don't think you're even familiar with my space anymore and the question started coming up you know how is social media going to impact the workplace how is it going to affect the decisions we as employers are making uh, with respect to hiring firing you know everywhere in between monitoring you know, what is really off duty outside of the workplace conduct anymore when you have social media becoming more and more prevalent. And if you've ever bothered to go to any of the sites for social media uh, pages, you'll learn that uh, they have these statistics and it shows the exponential growth rate of, of the social media site. And you can see how it was like a near quadrupling with Facebook every year for five years. And and I, I think I read a statistic at one point in time that said that the average user on Facebook has an, an average of 200 friends or 100 friends. So you know you're all best friends with that many people. I'm sure that you can make the top of your head. And and I think that just kind of understanding this as we get into some of the topics that impact the workplace is important. Because, you know, we all have to be on the same page and recognize how prevalent it is that what is posted online is something that is not going to be seen in all likelihood by one or two people. It's out there. It's in a semi-public forum. I think you'll understand what I mean by that when we talk a little bit more about privacy issues. And we just need to be aware of it. So as I get into this today, please, we have an hour and 15 minutes or, or so. I welcome any and all questions that you have. If there's anything that's come up in, in your work environment that you want to discuss, examples, questions, please feel free to interrupt me throughout the presentation today. I think that makes it a lot more uh, relevant and useful for everyone who is attending. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, you can see the, the topics I, I hope to, to be able to cover today. And um, some of these we may go through a little bit more quickly. But let's start with hiring. Now, the hiring process is something that has remained somewhat steady. You know, we have an application process generally, and maybe there's some background checking involved. And then we select candidates for interviews, and then we you know, send an offer for a position, essentially. Those are the, the basic steps. And Early on and, and consistently over the past six or so years, HR and, and other hiring managers have looked at using social media in this process. And, and why is this something that's so appealing? Because it's free to search online. It is readily accessible at your fingertips. It's pretty easy. And the turnaround is instant, right? We all want gratification. Um, you learn things on social media, though, that you wouldn't otherwise be learned on the application. You know that there are certain questions we're not supposed to ask on the application. And, you know, this is a double-edged sword. It's both a positive and a negative that you learn things you wouldn't otherwise know. And so that's really what I need to flag for your attention is, you know, what to watch out for, um, you know, what information you might be exposed to unintentionally, what information could lead to risk down the road, lawsuits, charges, even if it has no impact whatsoever on a hiring decision. Um, another thing to keep 
keep in mind, um, and, and these are some interesting concepts, is that the information you find may not be reliable. I have actually seen cases, I think there was one case in Texas years ago, where someone just made up a false Facebook page. And you know they put it under the person's name, they did a, a profile, and it was detailed, and it was believable, and it was a big phony page. And you know, some states have actually enacted laws that find that that kind of thing where you impersonate someone on social media is unlawful. Um, you might have 19 million John Smiths out there. So how can you be sure that the person whose Facebook page you believe you found is really your job applicant or the candidate? And then you have, um, we'll get into the unintentional exposure to these factors, because um, that's really the big But understanding generational differences. If, if you make social media a really big part and an important part of your background in the searching and hiring process, then we have to be cautious not to discredit or penalize applicants who are not on social media. And you know there are statistics out there that look at the different generations that are more inclined and more likely to be, have a very strong presence on Facebook and other forms of social media. So keeping that in mind as you move forward, let's talk about the unintentional exposure to the factors. What kind of things are we not allowed to ask in an interview or that we wouldn't ask about on a job application? Like um, age. Age, very good. Race. <laughs> um, yes. Right, marital status. How about whether you have kids? Children. <clears throat> Disabilities. Religion, yeah, all the big key factors. What are the types of, of information, the categories of information most likely to be present on a Facebook page? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, how can you protect yourself? If, you know, we want to take this strong, good faith position that when we make our hiring decisions, we are basing those decisions on legitimate, lawful reasons and also whether we're gonna select somebody for an interview. So how do I show and prove as, as a good faith employer that when I accessed you know, this candidate's Facebook page and found, oh, I don't know, a bunch of drugs scattered on a table somewhere, that my decision not to select them for an interview for our important job at our company had nothing to do with the fact that I also saw you know, a wheelchair in the background or, you know, some other protective factor, you know, take your pick. Well, we have some recommendations on how you might go about doing that. If you decide, and, and I don't like to recommend one way or the other whether you should use social media in the hiring process because it is very much a, a, a company-specific decision, but I, I, I do feel very strongly that there are ways that you can create some protections that will um, reduce the risk to your business. So here's what we can do. Number one, in our employment application, we can have, we already have waiver forms and acknowledgement forms that have to be signed, the disclaimers if you're going to do a background check. Well, you can address this um, in, in, such a, in such a waiver. You can assign someone who is not going to be making the decisions about who gets selected for an interview and who ultimately is going to be hired to do this online social media searching process. And then at the same time, ask them to document what it is that they are going to, whatever they found on these sites, if anything, that they're planning to pass on to the decision maker. So you're almost you know, creating a written timeline that documents, okay, I may have been exposed to all of this protected information, but here's what I actually convey to the person who is making the call. And, and so the decision maker can truthfully testify, if need be, down the road that I had no idea about this protected information, but I did know about the drugs that were on the table, and I don't think that's going to be appropriate for what we're looking for. Um, documentation is always important, it, you know, throughout the, the hiring process. That goes without without question. Considering only the job-related criteria. Um, this is a whole other topic, but the EEOC has weighed in, uh, 
recently on the background check process. And we know, based on, on their views, that we can't just automatically discredit, or we shouldn't be automatically discrediting anyone just based on some criminal past. We have to establish job necessity and, and some, take some other measures before we do any of that. How about being consistent? This is another uh, principle that I, I, I live by, and, and I, I'm constantly advising clients. Think about what you're looking at and, and the factors that are before you and when you're making your decisions, and whether you've been confronted with a similar set of circumstances in the past. Did you grant that person an interview? You know, yes or no, what's the difference? Could you defend your decision not to hire someone for whatever reason based on what you find on social media? Another little wrinkle, I guess, in, in this analysis, and, and I mentioned it on the slide, I haven't really seen this come up a whole bunch, but you know, information searches on current employees, I think there are some industries where you might have, um, you know, within certain classifications, an obligation to conduct, you know, updated background searches. Is anyone affected by that in, in their business? Okay. We can well, okay. I, I mean, we kind of are because we have to have qualified drivers and okay. if, if somebody would have a criminal record, that would, you know, we would need to know it if it came on after their employment. So. Right. So you've got the DOT yeah, guidelines? Would, yeah. So, and, well, and, and with that, you have a pretty regimented search process. You are actually conducting a thorough background search. And so the social media implications might not become part of that. Um, you know, this is probably a good time to mention that if someone handed you something, uh, you know, like a, a social media printout that suggests that one of your drivers engaged in criminal behavior, do you just ignore it and pretend like it never happened? Probably not. Um, it, it, you might conduct an investigation and, and go through your normal process as you would just verbally told about something like that. Now that we, um, you know, we kind of talked about the hiring process, we're shifting gears a little bit into the privacy implications with social media. And a lot of companies have started implementing, if you haven't already, policies, either a social media policy, internet usage, network policies that address uh, use of the company's computers, electronic devices, the company internet email system, and also whether there is a right to monitor that activity. And if so, are we looking at only activity at work? What about when we're working from home? And you can kind of see how this goes on and on. How many of you have such a policy that addresses internet usage, right to monitor, anything in this world? We're almost so a little over half, it seems like. Okay. And, and there's a lot of reasons, you know, for and against this. I mean, one of the things is, um, you know, considerations I, I think about. You can lay everything out in a policy, but are you really going to do all these things that you say you're going to do? Um, whether you want to preserve the ability to look at an employee's internet activity during the company time. Do you have the capability to check that? Just some practical considerations. And with that comes, and a lot of people, as you can understand, are, are checking Facebook and it, you know, while they're at work, it takes five seconds to log on and, and you know, update your profile or check any recent posts. Then you log off and you're done. So are, are we managing our, our employees' time effectively? And some employers have an interest in wanting to track that. But I guess with that, we have to keep in mind that there are some legal implications. We have federal and state laws that you have to be aware of and, and concerned about. Um, it isn't entirely clear what the you know the full picture framework is, but we have seen some cases develop, and that's how we've been able to identify what laws come into play, where there's been you know an alleged violation of, of whatever law because an employer somehow got their hands on some 
electronic activities, whether through social media or other devices. And, and I want to talk to you about the first one here, the Stored Communications Act. What is the Stored Communications Act? Um, this isn't something that is like widely publicized. It's actually not even thought of in terms of employment law. But we've seen it come up where a, an electronic message is intercepted. And the definition, if you have, I mean, this is a really, really long statute, and we don't have time today to cover the whole thing. But, you know, ultimately what you're, you're looking at is internet search history and emails on a company server are within the scope of, of this law. And and, and I think that that's important because you can't have, and, and the law prohibits unauthorized access to those things. So I think this highlights why it's important as an employer if you want to monitor these activities. You know, most most companies take the position that company email belongs to the company. And although we sometimes allow light personal emailing back and forth, just like we allow limited personal phone calls, um, that all of the emails belong to the company. But not in all cases. This has been challenged across the country. So it's something that is, is somewhat of an easy fix. Include in your policies that the company email system belongs to the company. And we reserve the right to monitor these emails. They do not belong to you as a, you know, these are not your own personal communications as an employee. We saw a case in 2009 out of New Jersey, and, and I think that this is an, an interesting example involving the Stored Communications Act, where um, a, this was at a restaurant, and it turned out that a group of bartenders and servers formed, um, in, in back then, 2009, remember this was sort of the early days of social media, public platforms, they created this online blog where they were talking about their, their management at the restaurant and obviously complaining and talking negatively about them. And this blog was password protected. Somehow, some, some, at some point along the way, one of the managers convinced a server or bartender to give them the password. They heard about it through the, through the grapevine that this was going on and said, hey, do you mind giving me the password? I'd like to log in and see what everybody's saying. And they said, oh, okay, sure, Mr. Boss, let me give you the password. And so they went on and saw all of these disparaging negative comments, and people were fired. And so, of course, all of the disgruntled employees said, okay, that was a, that was a big no-no, Stored Communications Act violation. And there the court found that the employer was in the wrong because even though the employee willingly said, here you go, here's the password. It wasn't like they hacked into the, the, the system at all. That was seen as a coerced uh, handover of that information because of the, the position that, that the manager had over them, the level of authority. That wasn't voluntary, a voluntary disclosure. So that was an unauthorized access to this electronic communication. This case, I, I just want to point out to you, it's <coughs> Loving Care Agency is another example involving an employer's right to access or desire to access emails and how it didn't properly preserve that right. And this goes to language and, and policies and good drafting. With respect to privacy, this is another question. This is probably one of the newer uh, hot topics that have come up in the privacy Employers ask, am I allowed to ask or require applicants or my employees and or my employees to give me their logins and passwords to their social media sites? How about to their personal email sites? Am I allowed to require this or even ask for it? Or even ask to see them? Can I do that? And, and, and I think those are legitimate questions. I mean, if you want to, so many people kind of got onto the privacy settings you can establish with Facebook, and you can really set up some good firewall protections so that unless somebody is friends with me, they can't see what I'm posting on my Facebook page. And the privacy settings have evolved over the years as well. 
that, is, that has changed quite a bit. But um, we've started seeing legislation come out, state and federal, where the states are, are creating laws where it would be unlawful for employers to ask for that information or require it. And with some hefty penalties in place if you, if you violate that. And in focusing on both the applicant and employees, which is kind of interesting. Um, I, I can see this coming up in, and I don't know the answer to this question yet, but in, in like a sex harassment investigation, I have some allegations from an employee who comes to me and says, five of my male coworkers are harassing me on Facebook constantly. And I don't know what to do about it. It's really uh, destroying my work environment. I can't do my job. I can't do anything. Well, you know, they, they defriended them. And, and now I can't see what they're saying. But before, they were saying a ton of stuff about me. And now I'm hearing from other coworkers that they continue to spread rumors about me. They're talking about me on Facebook. So as an employer, how do you respond to that? And, you know, without asking your employees, <coughs> to show you what's on Facebook. It creates some inherent problems with this legislation. We have uh, a version, by the way, pending in Ohio. That's um, what's reflected on the slide. It, you know, everything I said, what would make it unlawful. And, and there are some carve outs, some exceptions if you are conducting certain types of investigations like uh, trade secrets investigations. But it isn't entirely clear how it would be handled. This hasn't gone anywhere yet. It's just been introduced. It's very early in, in the process. <coughs> Other states have already passed laws like this. I found this here with uh, you know, school states that have pending legislation. And even at the federal level, last year, right around this time last year, a bill was introduced federal legislation. Take a look at that uh, potential penalty, $10,000 fine for violating this. This is a very serious concern, and that, I think, sends a pretty strong message. Now, again, it doesn't mean a whole lot if it doesn't go anywhere. It might just be pending, and then it will drop off and expire. Segwaying from, from privacy issues, Understanding what risks you face, if you're kind of on the fence right now and whether you really want to have a strong presence of social media in your workplace, do you want to allow employees or encourage them even to be on social media? I don't know the answer. Sometimes that makes sense for your business and sometimes it doesn't. Um, you know, you have diminished productivity and like I, I flag, the harassment component is something to watch out for. Reputational issues. Wage hour issues. How many people employ folks with access to work email from their iPhones? Right. And then how many of the people in that have access to those work emails are salary non exempt? Don't answer that one right now. <laughs> um, for the non exempt folks who are paid hourly and entitled to overtime, how do you track? This, this email access from home. You know, is all of the time being logged? It, it, it creates some pretty obvious logistical issues. Another uh, big piece of social media, and this is really where I think a, a lot of the discussion needs to focus, is with the National Labor Relations Act. Are you all familiar with this? Do we have any union work environments here, non-union mostly? All right. Well, the NLRA <coughs> applies to both union and non-union settings. So it, it's something that we all have to pay attention to and understand what the basic rights are under the Act. And um, this is a new forum where there's, I hate to use the word attack on social media, but there's a strong focus being paid uh, to social media policies, other company policies, and then firing decisions of employees based on social media postings. I've got some good examples in here of all of those things for you. But just to, to kind of understand the backdrop in general and what your rights are under the NLRA. Um, okay. 
as a as a big principal, um, the NLRA affords employees, all employees, the right to engage in protected concerted activity um, to without uh, intrusion by their employers, without monitoring and surveillance, <coughs> unlawful surveillance of their activities. So. This is the other side and component to whether we want to track internet activity. Uh, there are cases that have kind of gone both ways about whether if an employee accesses their personal webmail account, <coughs> or whether that is a private communication or not, if it happens on a work computer, by the way, just as a heads up. And that is, if that's just not clear in Ohio which, which way the court would go on it. Um, with, with policies, we talk about best practices. And um, big picture concept with the NLRA, we can't do anything as a company that is going to interfere with an employee's rights under that law. And, and their rights are, uh, this is one of the slides that comes later, but just so we can have it as a backdrop, protected speech and protected activity. That is their right to discuss their wages, their hours, their terms and conditions of employment, negatively or positively. It's their right to form um, together, and you know whether they do that online, on the phone, in person, and to join together to create this united front to discuss those matters, to form a union, and, and, and I think a lot of people believe generally, okay, the NLRA only has to do with unionizing and, and that's it. But it's much, much broader than that. And so what we've seen recently is with the NLRB, the agency that um, governs and enforces this law, they're looking at employer policies and language in, in its form is drafted as being overly broad and saying, although you're not saying right in your policy that we want to um, interfere with your right to, you know, your rights under the NLRA, I think an employee could read that as being overly restrictive. They could come up with some ima imaginary scenario where uh, that would interfere with their rights. Even though you as the company had no intention for that to be the case, that's kind of how they're doing this. And we're seeing example after example of where they're finding employer policy. And we you see something unlawful for that reason and with that rationale. And, and then the same rings true with, with the employee firings. We get towards that um, discussion at the end, but with the same concept in mind that these employees were joining together uh, to discuss concerns about their wages, hours, terms, and conditions of employment, and you fired them for that reason. And, and boiling it down to that concept. All right. Also, with the concerted piece, we talked about what is protected. Concerted means that it, it's one, it could be one person who joins with another, or one person speaking on behalf of his or her coworkers as well, as long as it's regarding more than one person's issues with their, with their employment. It is not meant to include the personal griping and attacks uh, or concerns shared by just one individual. There's like a semi-quiz that comes up, so just kind of, that's why I'm boiling this down for everybody to give you a quick version here. I want to give you some examples of, of policy language, and, and you may be surprised as we read this, thinking, ooh, this is kind of familiar to me. I think I've seen this before. I can't imagine why this would be a model. Here we go. Employers are required to report to management any unsolicited or inappropriate electronic communications they receive. This was unlawful. Why? Because some employees could reasonably view that language and the rule as restraining them from being able to communicate with their fellow employees or third parties about maybe the desire to form a union, about their terms and conditions of employment. You may look at this and say, I don't think that's at all where this was going, but you can you can see the direction that we're headed. Another rule, prohibiting employees from making disparaging or defamatory comments, as well as a lengthy policy that restricted employees from speaking to the press or media representatives without prior authorization. 
What's wrong with that? Uh, that's unlawful. According to uh, the, the NLRB decisions and, and the lower level decisions looking at the language um, and, and saying, you know, we will generally recognize that employers have a right to be concerned about what employees might say to the media, but you can't word it in such a way that it might encompass their desire to talk to the media about protected speech like their terms and conditions of employment. So what do we need to do? We have to reword things and, and, and kind of add some context to it and be more specific in what we want to prohibit. What's wrong with prohibiting disparaging or defamatory statements? Disparaging, once again, could be, could be interpreted as something negative about my boss that I want to complain to all of my colleagues about you know, on Facebook after work. Another policy, professional misconduct policy stating don't pick fights and reminding employees to communicate in a professional tone without making objectionable or inflammatory comments. This one's unlawful too, um, because again, it could include the discussions about the protected speech. Um, the reference here to um, the, it's the former acting general counsel for the NLRB, Lake Solomon. He, he established over about an 18 month time frame this series of decisions where they looked at the Facebook policies and the other employer policies and then also firing decisions. And he you know, offered some feedback and said, this is why we found it to be unlawful. So it was supposed to be some guidance to help us draft our policies and revise existing policies. But even within that, we have found some inconsistencies. And, and it is tough to follow. But I think um, most, most practitioners would agree that do employment law, there are at least some basic principles that we can, we can pull from, from the decisions that can help guide us and protect us. Let's say, in the interest of time, we'll just skip over that. Um, First ever board level decision. Do you, do you understand with, with the NLRB, just like with most government agencies, there's lower level agencies that you know assigned to each jurisdiction and state that initially will uh, review cases, decide them, and they ultimately might make them their way all the way up to the board level, um, which is seen to be the highest level in that agency. Um, the first board decision about the social media policies didn't come until 2012. And there they were looking at, um, and they found a violation with Costco's policy. And in that case, the rule prohibited employees from electronically posting statements that could damage the company or damage any person's reputation. I see a lot of puzzle cases out there <laughs> trying to really grapple with this and understand what's wrong with that, right? Well, um, here's, let's look at the language. The, you know, the whole policy. Any communication transmitted, stored, or displayed electronically must comply with the policies outlined in the Costco employee agreement. <coughs> Employees should be aware that statements posted electronically, such as to online message boards or discussion groups, that damage the company, defame any individual, or damage any person's reputation, or violate the policies outlined in the Costco employee agreement may be subject to discipline up to and including termination of employment. Is it any clear yet what, uh, what the problem is with this policy? All right, what we learned from that case and, and what we've seen in, in other past examples, it's overly broad. It wasn't properly restricted. Any disparaging comment or anything about someone else that might be disparaging, well, that could be it might make the company look really bad and damage the company's reputation if I talk about how they failed to pay me my wages for two months, right? So we have to narrow the scope of what we're restricting and be really specific. We have to look at, and these are the principles that I said we've been able to pull from the various social media decisions, and consider the context of the prohibited statement. So here we have one, um, and the example is that Adding an explicit statement 
prohibiting social media activity that includes disparaging remarks that are not related to a dispute over working conditions and statements that are defamatory and maliciously false. That maliciously false is language that the board looked at and said, if you add that in the context with defamatory, it's okay. It gives it some further explanation because that would never be lawful for someone to make maliciously false defamatory statements. Um, not related to a dispute over working conditions. That is creating some, without directly saying, we won't interfere with your rights to engage in Section 7 protected act, concerted activity under the NLRA. You're protecting, you're carving out what we don't <coughs> want to protect you from doing. Next principle, reading conduct as a whole. Sometimes we want, and, and a lot of policies will continue to say, we prevent you and, and restrict you from engaging in disparaging activity, which shall include, but is not limited to. And then we give a list of examples, and the list contains clearly unlawful conduct and, and unacceptable workplace misconduct that in no way, shape, or form can be construed as you know, infringing on these protected concerted activities. That's a good way to do it. Statements which are slanderous or are detrimental to the company appearing on the same list um, with this kind of concept in mind as statements that constitute unlawful racial or sexual harassment. Does that make sense? You know, the little carve out. And then there's always, <coughs> you know, at the end of the policy, if they have a handbook and really big full letters to include the general disclaimer that we're not trying to infringe upon your legal rights. And we're going to expressly tell you we are not trying to infringe upon any of your rights under protected under the NLRA. Okay. And if I if I haven't made it clear yet, this is not applicable to you know or limited just to social media policies. This is something I've seen crossover with a lot of different employer policies that we've gone back and reviewed <coughs> and years and had to update and tweak a little bit just to kind of create this extra layer. Anybody have any thoughts or questions you want to talk about with the policies? Okay, now we're going to get uh, transition here into the firings because this, this can get pretty interesting. Um, there are, just you know, to be aware, by way of background, there are states that prohibit employers from taking adverse actions against employees for lawful off duty conduct. But Ohio isn't one of them. And so that goes back to the question, if I'm made aware of information uh, that it impacts the work environment, but it occurs on non-working time, at someone's home, through the social media forum, what do I do about it? Do I have to do anything about it? And I think generally the advice that I, I would give, I mean, everything is like case by case scenario anymore, but is this something that if it didn't involve social media at all, is it something that's, that you would normally investigate or you think you should look into further that can kind of guide you a little bit in that decision? Okay, so all right, why does the NLR what does the NLRB have anything to say about employee firings because of social media? Because, again, the comments that they're making are being viewed in some cases as protected concerted activity. This is going to be a tough one for you. If you couldn't buy the social media policy language, this is going to be a tough one to buy into and see some of these. We've got an example here. This is one of those cases that we were following, and it finally made it all the way up to the board level, and the board upheld the, it's an uh, administrative law judge that rules on, on the case just below the board level, and they upheld the finding. And this was um, in, in Buffalo, and what happened in this case, uh, a group of employees were fired after the employer um, the public agency learned about what they were discussing on Facebook and um, they were criticizing pretty strongly and aggressively a co-worker um, and in here the ALJ and then the board approved that decision and said mm -hmm, can't do that that was an unlawful firing of those five employees 
so they get reinstatement with back pay. What do you think of that? I mean, coming into to your business and telling you that we're going to reverse the decision that you made about firing someone. And, and that all along, the employer took the position here that this was unlawful bullying and harassment. And, and while we're trying to figure out what are we supposed to do when we're conducting harassment investigations or general complaints from employees and we're investigating them, how far do we take it? How do we know what our limitations are? Well, this case tells us a little bit. Why don't we take a look at what was posted? And this is just a sampling, and the typos are direct quotes, not mine. Labor. Okay, so just a little sampling of, of what was on Facebook. A coworker feels we don't help our clients enough at home. I about had it. My fellow coworkers, how do you feel? What the expletive? Trying, uh, try doing my job. I have five programs. What the hell? We don't have a life as is. What else can we do? Tell her to come do my acting uh, job and see if I don't do enough. This is just dumb. I think we should give our paychecks to our clients so they can pay the rent. Obviously, you know, with a, a negative connotation there about the client. Insert sarcasm here now. Okay. You know, think about in the back of your mind, how would you react if you found out that, you know, your employees weren't having this conversation on Facebook? And, and ask yourself whether if the, the subject of the attack is coworker who they're all talking about. Um, if I told you that this person was so upset about the post that they suffered a heart attack within a week or two of this whole incident, does that impact how you would decide and what to do with these employees? That happened in this case, by the way. So, so is the problem, Jamie, that they went in and viewed this, or was the problem that they – is that just like one count and then they used it to fire them? Is that a second count? Or it, does it actually work? That's a good question. And um, the fact that they viewed what was on Facebook was not the issue in this case. That only comes up if somebody alleges, um, and it depends on what laws are brought up. This was only viewed strictly from whether it's a lawful decision under the you know NLRB's point of view and, and their board law, existing board precedent. And so what they said, they were looking at what was discussed. So is your, your decision to terminate. Although you as the employer are legitimately telling us that you believe these discussions violated your anti-harassment policies and other workplace policies, we don't care what you thought they did. We look at this speech as being protected concerted activity. These are employees, more than one, who got together on Facebook and they were discussing and, and obviously negatively, but their reaction to another coworker's criticism of their job performance. That was protected speech. And it didn't matter that there were expletives involved. That was a very minor, minor thing in, in, in the board's view in this case. And they also didn't care about the fact, they were not persuaded, I will say, by the fact that um, the individual suffered the health problems so closely in connection with, with the post. Does that answer your question, Tom? Is that, yeah. Now, I, I want to point out that, you know, there was one post that talked about having their clients come and pay the rent. I mean, clearly they were providing public housing. And, you know, that in those situations where the subject of the attacking, aggressive social media post relates directly to the clients or customers, the board views that a little differently. So if we're looking at that as the basis for a decision, the employer's you know, firing or discipline decision is more likely to be repelled because you do not have a protected right to complain about your customers as a general matter. So let's talk about this case. This is the Carl Moss Motors case. Um, this one made it all the way up to the board level as well. Uh, again, the, the ALJ's decision was affirmed, and here we had, it was like two side-by-side -side dealerships um, in Land Rover and BMW, and you have the BMW salesperson kind of standing outside at some point during the day, and he observes an incident happen at the Land Rover dealership. Um, and apparently, there was a teenage boy who was with his parents shopping, 
he gets into the, the demo car into the Land Rover and something happens, not sure how this happened, but he ends up like driving the Land Rover into the ditch, okay, in the local pond, like right there on the property. And the BMW salesperson thought this was hilarious, so he decided to post um, this incident on Facebook, and, and this is what he said, this is your car, this is your car on drugs, featuring pictures he took of the Land Rover in a pond. This is what happens when a salesperson allows a 13-year-old boy to get behind the wheel of a 6,000-pound truck. The kid drives over his father's foot and into the pond in all about four seconds and destroys the $50,000 truck. Oops. <laughs> so what, what, why are we even talking about this as a Facebook fire, and why would his employer care about that? Well, it just so happened that they um, were jointly owned, both dealerships, same owners, um, and they didn't appreciate that posting at all, and, and so he was fired because of that. Now, right within the same week, and we know that we can track the timeline of when Facebook posts are made, because they're listed, um, although um, the employer, and I want to make this point very clear, they didn't even point to this other Facebook post as the basis for the decision. But the salesperson did in his defense and said, uh-uh, you can't, you can't look at all, you know, just one thing isolated at a time. You guys fired me unlawfully for this. Um, the BMW salesperson, mind you. So in, in, in response to a customer appreciation event, he posted this. BMW 2011 5 Series Soiree. I was happy to see that Nas went all out for the most important launch of a new BMW in years, the new 5 Series, a car that will generate tens of millions of dollars in revenues for Nas over the next few years, the small 8-ounce bag of chips and a $2 cookie plate from Sam's Club, and the semi-fresh apples and oranges were such a nice touch, but to top it all off, the hot dog cart, where our clients could obtain an overcooked wiener and a steel bun. Alright, so why are we even talking about this? <coughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't think that, that his, his employer really appreciated that one either. But um, in, in this case, the board looked at, at the two different posts in isolation. And because the, the employer only considered the Land Rover post as the basis for the decision uh, to fire him, they said, okay, this was a lawful firing. And why is that? Because what he posted about what happened at the Land Rover uh, dealership had absolutely nothing to do with his terms and conditions of employment. It didn't affect him and it also was not concerted because he wasn't, you know, making a, that statement on behalf of anyone else, any of his other co-workers. And although it didn't have to, the board decided to weigh in on how it, how it would have ruled if the dealership would have fired him for the BMW post, which, you know, is maybe equally, if not more sarcastic. And um, here they said that that would have been protected speech. Now, it's not clear whether it would have been concerted because it was still only his individual post, but they found that that was protected, and why was that? Because, it, yeah, his sales, his commissions. If it's some, you know, chintzy, you know, cheesy event to, to you know, try to rake in new customers, and he gets fewer sales as a result, that affects his wages. look at some other quick examples. I want to make sure I reserve enough time for questions. So if you have any, you can interrupt me. Maybe some of these examples will spark some questions. Sure. Can you back up to that last? Sure. In the BMW, if an employee instead just walked into his boss's office and verbally face-to-face -face said, you're an idiot, and said the exact same thing, mm -hmm. and the, the employer said, fine, you're an idiot, you have a bad attitude, you're fired, and would, would that still that it's a protected communication and it's not a good basis for firing? Well, that brings up, I think, two issues. The you're an idiot, I think, is the basis for the termination because that is a direct insult and probably going to violate some sort of workplace conduct policy. You're not really supposed to call your boss an idiot. Well, what if you just said Last nothing more than what he posted? Just like every word right in here. I think it, it doesn't make any difference whether he said it yeah, in a public forum or even just in the workplace, if we're going to make the decision based on it, we have to look at whether it's the protected speech and then also whether it was concerted. 
So there, it would actually, you'd have to take it a little further. Is he making this like big complaint and taking the stance on behalf of all of his coworkers? Possibly, quite possibly. There are so many great examples from this industry. For some reason, I can't imagine why. Um, this is bartender Facebook post about the tipping policy. And he verbally complains, so maybe this will help guide us a little bit, to his coworkers that the employer's tipping policy sucked. Coworker agreed, but neither shared their, this concern with management. And six months later, the bartender engaged in a discussion with his stepsister on Facebook complaining that he was underpaid. He also called his customers rednecks and stated that he hoped they choked on blacks as they drove <laughs> That's nice. None of his coworkers responded to the post. The next day, he received a Facebook message from the owner of the body of his termination. So what do you think, based on everything we know and what we've talked about today, would this be an unlawful discharge under the NLRA? Lawful? Okay. Lawful. Some people think I'm awful. Well, oh, okay, we didn't have the, the answer. I'll just tell you the answer. This one was upheld as being a lawful discharge. And here's why. You have to break it apart. Uh, yeah, the primary focus here is on the customer, but the disparaging statement that, that actually led to the termination was actually the Facebook post about, about the customers, once again, but to his stepsister. Not to, a, not to a co-worker. There was no evidence that any co-workers responded and shared in his opinion about tipping policy. And, and they actually addressed this earlier statement with another co-worker about how the tipping policy sucked and said that was a very isolated comment and it really wasn't the driving force or focus of the termination. Now, I, I suppose that this could have gone the other way and, and they could have looked at this and said, we could, we could stretch that out and make it part of the decision. But I think that uh, this is, again, a, an example where when the customers are being attacked and, and really the, the primary subject that they're more inclined to, to uphold the employee's decisions. Ooh, this is another good one. All right, we are um, at a um, mental hospital and during her shift, an employee was uh, talking on Facebook to her friends, um, non-co-workers, stating spooky is overnight, third floor, alone in a mental institution. <clears throat> By the way, I'm not a client, not yet anyway. My dear client, Miss One, is cracking up at my post. I don't know if she's laughing at me, with me, or at her voices. I don't need to restrain anyone. We have a great rapport. I'm beginning to detect when people start to decompensate. Now she was fired after one of her Facebook friends friends in quotes, one of her 200 Facebook friends, who also was a former client, told on her about it, and, and the employer did not appreciate that. Is this an unlawful discharge under the NLRA? This is a little tougher, right? Yeah, that's a good point. So I think I'm, I'm hearing, you know, lawful, but we've heard privacy, HIPAA issues, great point, and that you're exactly right. Um, this was lawful. This discussion was with non-coworker friends. She was not, and she wasn't even discussing her terms and conditions. Generally describing your work environment and, and patients is not considered protected concerted activity here. And this brings up a really good point about employees who work in environments where we have HIPAA, HIPAA implications and patient privacy concerns. And we've seen a lot of this in the medical field, nurses or doctors going home and posting even about their day. I had a case where XYZ and they describe enough facts about you know the patient that they treated that once it ends up on the news, you figure out who it is or people can detect who it is and inadvertently reveal protected health information. That is a big, big, big concern. Mm -hmm. And so anyone who has um, a, a workplace that's affected by HIPAA and privacy <coughs> issues uh, along those lines have to carve out even more protections in any social media policies or other policies where we are addressing employee speech at home. Yes? What about a situation where a teacher 
maybe talking about students it's either. FERPA. It's covered by FERPA. The same thing as HIPAA. Same thing? Mm -hmm. Either positively or negatively? Yeah, I had yeah. a feeling that, yeah. It's it, covered by FERPA. And we actually, although I don't know whether we'd be upheld, we, we actually go so far as to not permit our staff to friend their students even when they're of age if they're still enrolled in the school. Well, that, that is an interesting point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of overlap there. You can see how this can spiral out of control. Mm -hmm. So some Sorry, other recent, these are just uh, I guess, <laughs> FYI examples of recent uh, social media, Facebook firings in the news. 23-year-old um, deputy finance director for Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker fired for writing offensive posts on Twitter. Twitter. So what do we say? I will choke that illegal mess cleaning in the library. Stop banging blank chairs around and turn off your Walkman. This bus is my worst blank nightmare. Nobody speaks English and these people don't know how to control their kids. <laughs> Problematic? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah. There you go. I mean, just all of these issues that we see, right, yeah, that illegal mess cleaning in the library. Um, I think, if any, anything, these examples will, like, drive the point home how online posts do not go away. And, you know, Twitter, we know, is just a very quick means of communication. And, you know, there can be so many Twitter followers, thousands, hundreds of thousands in some situations. And think about how quickly anything you say or post is passed along to others, even if you try to take it down and delete it. Here we go in, in, the, in the education school setting. Do you, well, we have a coach uh, in Idaho who posted this picture uh, of her fiance grabbing her chest. Uh, she was fired for this. Imagine that. Parents see it. I mean, there's a lot of implications. Yes. I'm just curious, why was she fired and not him? He's the one grabbing her. Isn't that a good question? <laughs> I forget. Maybe right. because it was her posting. Okay. There was uh, there was something else I don't remember though. I remember reading this. Yeah. But I, I don't remember what it was. Yeah, I mean there's always you know, you look at those factors and these are just like news headlines. They haven't really made it to any cases oh. to It had something it. to do with the fact that she was a woman and she was in a bikini top and it it, okay. it, it I I don't think it'll be upheld should you yeah. challenge it, but. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> this is a rant against customers on Facebook, which I think, um, you know, we know is, is generally going to, you know, tip the scale more towards being upheld. This one's a little tough to read, but. Car to work this morning, and we currently have 275,000 customers without power. White people in Oakland County are pissed right now. They got blank, LOL, and don't call me acting a blank fool. I will hang up on you. This has been your DTE representative. <laughs> and so, and so here, I mean, there's clearly some sarcasm. And sure, we can think of a lot of examples where common pictures are made. But once you post them in a public forum or where they're accessible like this, semi-public or not, there are some extra implications and concerns. It's like no longer excusable. How about our very own favorite uh, wide receiver? Uh, good old Clayton Browns, here we go, Devon Best. He posted this picture on Twitter. I don't know if you, did you hear about this one? And it was within hours he took it down. But how many followers did he have on Twitter that had already retweeted it? it you know, what, what goes on Twitter stays on Twitter. It is not, you, you can't remove it. So this is showing his drugs and marijuana possession and, and could potentially lead to his termination. Of course, the, the team is gonna be pressured to do something about that. Not to mention his other activities later on. <laughs> Didn't <laughs> not the case at all, so. Um, so there you go. I mean, you can see that this is this is a very hot topic. There's a strong presence of social media that's going to continue to affect every single industry and field we can think of in some way, shape, or form. And and so um, this was my best attempt to give you a quick overview of the different legal issues. And if, if anything I've said has sparked any questions that you have that you want to ask me right now, I'm happy to answer them. Or otherwise, you have my contact information. Um,
for, for after the presentation. Yes? I, I guess I do have one. I'm trying to simplify this down into something that's relatable because there okay. you could make your mind spin here. <laughs> yeah. But um, so so in our working environment with small business owners, it's easy to get paranoid. You know, we have people, former employees who have gone on to satellite radio to say what fools we are and you know, go on their Facebook and all that. So all that is just like get over it. But if they go on to Facebook, for example, and um, start to uh, say things against our customer base, not even a particular customer per se, then that's crossing a line. Is that a good interpretation? I think generally yes. Now, if they're an ex-employee, it's kind of like, what are you going to do about it? Well, yeah. yeah. It, because it, it's not that it makes it unlawful. We're just trying to control the behavior in our employment at will setting of our existing yeah. employees. Yeah. But, you know, I've seen a lot of policies where we can still restrict, you know, trade secrets, confidential customer information from being revealed online. And you can set those measures up. They have to be carefully worded, but those are still fair game and you can create those kinds of protections. And there's always a good old defamation action if they are defaming your business and what they're saying is not true. Okay. Sure. Anybody else have any? Yes? Can you comment about, uh, do you mind if there's any significance, differences between Facebook versus LinkedIn? Yes. In, in content and any particular liability issues or risk issues that an employer has? Um, Generally speaking, LinkedIn is considered a professional platform for social media, and, and we've seen LinkedIn is getting more sophisticated. We can have online LinkedIn discussion groups. You can get alerts, of any updates from folks on LinkedIn. And LinkedIn is not a platform that I have seen any examples of where it's led to a termination or you know harassment issues where we're seeing that kind of problem. It, it could get there. It's certainly, you know, the more discussion you have, I think, the more apt you are to, to have those issues. There could be some privacy implications with LinkedIn. Um, there is like the upgraded form of LinkedIn that you can pay for, and then you can track who has visited your site and you know, your LinkedIn page, and track all of that information. And so I could certainly see, you know. What are we doing on LinkedIn? We are linking ourselves professionally. Are we also looking for other jobs sometimes? Mm -hmm. uh, or maybe we're not looking, but recruiters are looking at us. So we're if, using it as recruiters. Too. Right, exactly. I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of nuances here. And so possibly, if employers would require employees to give them LinkedIn passwords, we can see how that might be uh, you know, problematic with the pending legislation that prohibits you from requiring that information in all forms. Um, How about like liability issues where somebody clearly has pulled themselves out of, as an employee and then, you know, I think there's what, an endorsement feature or something where you can comment mm -hmm. on other people you're looking? I mean, uh, could, and they're not. could an employer be held liable for statements that an employee has made about somebody else? Oh, yes, 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 we do have that, that issue. We, um, this is an FTC issue and employers often carve out in social media policies that any statement that you make as an employee, you have to clearly state your role or, you know, a non-employee you couldn't control in, in this way, but for an, employee, an existing employee, you cannot make statements on your personal social media on behalf and, and represent it as being made on behalf of the company, you know, on behalf of the business, because we can be held accountable if you make certain representations. That is a problem. What I have seen, and it wasn't in that context, but I think it would apply um, as an immediate recourse, would be for the company to reach out to the social media 1-800 number that they have in their support team and ask LinkedIn to remove it. Because they can intercede in a lot of cases. We've seen that in, in, other, in other settings. Yes? I had a, uh, an, an incident happen last year that an employee took photos of a job site as a as a laborer but took tradesman photos and when he was relieved of his duties went to another firm and made indication that he had performed those duties and developed that that end result from a project oh, wow. so I was helped himself to that didn't he? I was called by by the firm 
when they were doing a hire through the hiring process and asked if he had in fact done the detailed work that he said he'd done. Okay. I didn't answer him because I felt that there was a very gray area there. So I just said, I'm sorry, I can't can't give you information on whether he did or whether he didn't. Mm -hmm. It's up to you to make your decisions on the information you have. But that was a very uncomfortable situation because it was outside of the text form. It was more from a photograph form wow. on a Facebook post. Yeah, well, and, and that's one thing. Um, some policies actually address that with, with actually with photographing different areas of the workplace. Do you consider that to be a company proprietary photo? Or, you know, based on if you're studying at a job and, and you know there's different parties involved, is that something that should be or can like from a contractual basis be posted on Facebook to, you know, stop that from happening at the at the very beginning? But I think that that's a really good point. That is problematic. Then I have, furthermore, and where I was ultimately became concerned on, on my end from a legal standpoint was some of our clients, we have waivers that state we can take photographs up to a year on their property and legally, you know, re re retain those photos. But then we have other clients that have had a sign off that we will not take photos. And if an employee you know, is taking a photo of a feature or, or an element, you know, at what point am I held responsible if they post it against, you know, off the clock or on their free time? Yeah, well, that would be a big concern. You know? Right. That would, you'd have to look at the way the contract is, is worded and what your restrictions are, if you're accountable for employees or if it's only your managers or certain representatives. Mm -hmm. But I would definitely want to make sure I've got some strict policies in place that even sign off with employees that they agree not to do things like that. Okay. Otherwise, they might have to, you know, you, you essentially, if you were held accountable, then you've got to go after them to indemnify you. Because mm -hmm. it's their conduct that created the basis for the liability. Mm -hmm. Jim, mm -hmm. going back to his example and getting that phone call mm -hmm. as a reference, um, could he have given up and said, no, he did not draw up those plans or those weren't, you know, he was just a worker on that job? Um, it, uh, that goes to, you know, how do we respond to ref employment? You're not allowed to say anything negative. Requires, yeah. What's your policy say in terms of what information you provide? I would just, I always go back to that one. Do we give name, rank, and serial number and that's it? Yeah. If so, we don't comment on it. That's Correct. just, I mean, it would be no different than... Um, you know, would you recommend them for employment? You know, do you answer that question? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. I think we're all out of time today, but I thank you all for your um, time and your attention. Thank you, Jamie. <coughs>